<laughs> and so, um, so then, so I decided to graduate school after that, and and at that point, oh, I was at Ohio State, and so Ohio State just hired a new math, mathematical ecologist. And those were sort of my two loves, mathematics and ecology. And that's when I decided I was going to get a PhD, and that's why I did my PhD. And then it's just, I still never made a plan, but it all worked out. <laughs> so that's my message. It all works out, or it doesn't. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is maternal effects in Lake Erie Walleye and Noah Perch. But before I even tell you what I mean by maternal effects, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Lake Erie Walleye and Yellow Perch. and uh, and then I'll try to lead into why we decide that we need to be studying maternal effects. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge my funders. So this work, much of this work is funded by the Ohio Division of Wildlife through its Sport Fish Restoration Act fund. And this fund uh, funded several graduate students, the training of several graduate students, a bunch of undergraduates, and some postdoctoral researchers. We also had some funds from the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, and of course, Ohio State through the College of Arts and Sciences provided a lot of funding for this work. All right. Oh, all my collaborators. Okay, so I had a bunch of collaborators on here. I just, I'm showing pictures of the ones from Ohio State. The top three up there are faculty that have um, collaborated very heavily on this, contributed a lot to this work. And the others are all graduate students and postdocs who have worked on this as well. What I'm not showing up there are some of these people, so there's, these are all Division of Wildlife, Ohio Division of Wildlife biologists. I could list probably 25 people up here who have contributed to this work. And so I'm not, I don't, I, it's hard to find pictures of them, so I can't list them all. So anyway, um, I have a lot of help on this from collaborators. This, this work has been going on for, um, I think I'm going to show you data from 2004 and later. So it's been going on for a long time. Okay, walleye and yellow perch. So, Walleye and yellow perch are really important fisheries in the lake. They're sport fisheries. They are commercial fisheries. The walleye sport fishery is the largest walleye sport fishery in the world. Uh, so these are really important economically in the lake. There are, these uh, fish are also important ecologically. They're both top predators. Uh, they can exhibit a, a lot of control over the ecological, the aquatic community in the lake. So we need to be able to study them. Uh, the other thing that I need to mention about them that's unusual is that they are, first of all, they're native to Lake Erie, and they are completely natural reproducing populations here. So we're not stocking these fish in the lake. And so the goal is to keep these fish, these fish populations, and the fisheries that they support sustainable. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So the one, what I want to talk, tell you about these fish is a little bit about what a year in the life of the fish is. So let's start with adults. Adult walleye, blue walleye, and yellow perch. They spend the summer feeding and growing, making up for some of that lost energy from spawning in the spring. Say, uh, uh, walleye and yellow perch have lots of differences. They're not at all the same fish, but I'm going to kind of ignore some of those differences right now and just show you the ways in which they are similar. So they do this through the fall. In the fall and winter, they start reproductive development. They start uh, vitellogenesis. They start forming things that will eventually become eggs that they spawn in the spring. So that's really early given that they don't start spawning until spring. They go through the winter, and then the walleye spawn in early spring. We typically think of walleye in Lake Erie spawning, at least in this part of Lake Erie, spawning, uh, peak spawning would be in the first two weeks of April. In some years, uh, for instance, in 2012, I don't know if you remember, but it was a really, really warm year. They were spawning as early as late February. So um, they can spawn at different times, but typically early spring, then their larvae are out in the lake. In the meantime, the yellow perch have started spawning, and their larvae are out in the lake. And so the larvae are now out in the lake, and they're feeding on zooplankton. The juveniles start, continue feeding on zooplankton. They feed on aquatic insects, other aquatic macroinvertebrates, and ultimately fish. And they just keep growing and, and surviving if they're lucky. But the, Many, many eggs hatched that don't survive, only a few survive. We get to the fall, and we say that in the fall, recruitment is set. And what we mean by that is that if you measure abundance of these fish after their first summer of growth, if you measure abundance of them, you'll have a good predictor of their abundance in that cohort in the next 
two years later, seven years later, ten years later. So we say recruitment is set. All the, the determination of whether this is going to be a strong year class or a weak year class, a strong cohort or a weak cohort, is set by that first year. So if we think these fish are important to know about, then it's important to study what's going on that's driving um, that recruitment to be set during the summer. And so this is the message here is that recruitment is highly variable across years in these fish. So on the x-axis here are years from 1992 to 2015. On the y-axis um, are number of fish at the end of the first summer, so in August. The red is yellow, purse, and the, and the blue is y. Okay, so what you can see is that it's highly variable. There's good years and there's bad years. There are more bad years than there are good years, but um, they don't have to have a good year every year. These are long lived fish. Yellow perch live into their teens, walleye live into their 20s, and so they can go for a number of years without having a good year class and still have a sustainable population. This, this time between good year classes, 2003 to 2015, was kind of stretching it a little bit, so we'll talk more about that later. So, um, we know recruitment is set by August, and we know recruitment is highly variable. So, what we have spent many, many years, and many other researchers spent many, uh, many years trying to figure out what drives recruitment. Okay, so we've discovered many things that are important that are the correlates of success of a cohort over that first summer. So predator abundance, see there's millions of these little fish out there and they're great food for predators and they don't have much predation evasion ability. Prey abundance, uh, it's not just how many prey are out there, so it's zooplankton prey that we need to have here for these little fish. It's not just having a lot of zooplankton, but it's having them where the larval walleye and yellow perch are. So these little fish, it, 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 little fish is here right outside Gibraltar Island. It doesn't matter if there's a bunch of food over at Kelly's Island. It's got to be in the right place at the same time as these larvae. So it's prey abundance and prey location and prey timing. So a lot of things have to go right for the uh, larvae to have food. River discharge. Now, I'm including this one just because, well, it turns out to be very important, but it's important in a very complicated way, and we don't understand it yet. We will know. So, first of all, we've seen a negative effect on walleye survival during the egg to larval phase. So, walleye are spawned in rivers, some of them, I'll talk to you more about that later. Um, and they, uh, the larvae, the eggs hatch in the river, the larvae move downstream. And if there's a high river discharge, you know, a big rain event right then, that's bad for survival. But high river discharge is possibly correlated with first summer walleye growth. So with, with river discharge comes nutrients. Okay, right now in, in Ohio, in, in Lake Erie, there's too many nutrients coming in with the river discharge. But with river discharge comes nutrients, that makes phytoplankton, that makes zooplankton. And so that's been responsible for leading to higher walleye growth when there's years of high nutrients. It's also had a positive effect on yellow perch survival and growth during the larval juvenile stage. And we think part of that, this is, this is work done by Stuart Ludson, and we think part of that is due to the, uh, the turbidity associated with the high discharge and the protection from visual predators that they get. But um, Chelsea will be telling us more about that sometime, wherever you are. There you are. <laughs> She's doing those experiments right now. It's a little scared when I started doing those experiments. I thought she might have negated this. Thank you. Okay, and the temperature. So temperature is really important. It affects growth rates. These things are porkelotherms. As, as the temperatures increase, their capacity for growth increases. It affects the prey. Temperature affects the prey community. That's something we're studying right now. And it affects the predator community. So, for instance, white perch, which is not a native fish, um, after, uh, if you have a couple of really warm years in a row, the white perch abundance goes up, and white perch are an important predator on yellow perch larvae. So we have all these factors that are characteristics of the egg, larval, and juvenile environment that might be driving recruitment. And we've shown that they do have an effect on recruitment. But then we also, a number of years ago, started looking at some other data. So this is, a, there's no data here, but I'm going to tell you what there's axis first. So an x-axis here, is percent ice cover in February and March in the winter before these fish are spawned. So this is the characteristic of the maternal environment, not the environment of the offspring. And on the y-axis, well, there used to be an index of juvenile abundance at the end of the at the end of the summer. 
Okay, and so this is what we see for walleye. There's something missing. There's a little bit of format issues here, but there must be a few more points of this. But this is what we see for walleye that the only time, let's see if this comes up, so the only time we get good recruitment is in years with high ice cover. We can get poor recruitment under any condition. Just one of those things has to go wrong, right? Not enough food, too many predators, whatever. But the only time we get good recruitment is when there's high ice cover. We see the exact same thing for yellow perch. Uh, the only good recruitment years is in years of high ice cover. Now, we could replace this x-axis with many different measures of winter severity. It could be, you know, a uh, number of days with, with temperatures less than some, some low temperature. It could be, um, it could be when you know, ice out occurs or something like that. So there's lots of ways you can look at this, and they all say about the same thing. So we are looking at factors that are affecting offspring, actually affecting the, the egg, larval, and juvenile environment. But what we've seen is that the environment experienced by the parents can also affect offspring success. So recruitment isn't driven only by what's going on with the offspring. It's also being driven by what's going on with the parents before they even spawn those eggs. And that leads me to maternal effects. So maternal effect is uh, when the phenotype of an organism, let's just say the offspring, the phenotype of this offspring is determined not only by its genotype and environment, but also by the genotype and environment of its mother. So, the example we just did, I flipped it sort of, is the temperature of the winter maternal environment is driving offspring success. Okay, um, but we also, so that's what we just showed, but I also want to talk about the phenotype by environment interaction of, you know, in the mother that, that leads to different phenotypic traits. And by phenotypic traits, it can be anything from morphology, it can be size, it can be behaviors like where she chooses to spawn. Um, phenotypic traits of uh, the offspring that we're interested in are things like survival. So those are all traits that we'll be interested in looking at. So for instance, as maternal size increases, we often see the number of offspring that she produces increase. That's not that surprising because as maternal size increases in fish, that she just has more capacity to make eggs. <coughs> What's a little more surprising is that in many fish we see when maternal size increases, the size of the eggs or the size of the larvae also increase. Now there's lots of theory as to why this should happen, when it should happen, but I'm not going to go into that theory. I, I'm just going to say that this is something we see quite frequently in fish. So we did some experiments. We did some field collections to study the parental traits and parental environment effect on the offspring. So when I started making this talk, I was actually talking about, I was going to talk about maternal and paternal together, parental effects. But I realized I was going to take too much time, so I've just gotten rid of the paternal effects. There might be some things left over in there, like saying parental instead of maternal there. Um, the maternal effects are ones that are most commonly studied and uh, the ones that are most interesting here. So we're looking at maternal traits and maternal environment, and things like age, size, energetic conditions, the winter conditions before spawning, and the spawning stock. So in, with walleye, walleye, um, the, the spawners move up rivers to spawn. They put the eggs in the river, uh, the eggs hatch, or larvae move downstream. Uh, they also, uh, walleye also spawn on shallow reefs in the lake. But they're quite faithful to their their spawning sites. So wherever they respond, that's where they come back to spawn. It's like a, a classic salmon story. Uh, they aren't 100% faithful, but it's a pretty strong fidelity to the spawning sites. So the spawning stock for walleye turns out to be something that's important that we study. Uh, yellow perch don't spawn in rivers, they spawn in the lake. They also have spawning stocks that's, that's um, not so much river associated, but just with uh, different basins in the lake. And the potential correlates of parental traits that we're looking at in the offspring are the number of eggs, the size of the eggs in the larvae, the egg survival rate, and the spawning date. Okay, so spawning date is kind of, it's hard to know if that's an offspring trait or a, a 
barter trade. So I'll use it in both ways here in the data I'm going to show you. But it's, it's something that the parent decides, so that's a behavioral trait of the parent, uh, the, the, the type of spawning date and spawning location. But it determines the offspring environment. So it's representative of what the offspring is going to be experiencing. So you'll see it move back and forth between be considered for the parents and the offspring. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some data we submitted. And we have data for walleye, and we have data for yellow perch. We have laboratory experiments for each of them, and we have some field surveys for each of them. So for walleye laboratory experiments, we were looking at the effects of maternal traits, including size, energetic condition, and spawning date, and their effect on offspring traits, including egg size, egg energy content, hatching success, and larval length. I'll talk about field surveys, in which we're looking at parental traits, maternal traits, that's all I'm going to show you, and maternal environments, so that's size, age, energetic condition, and spawning stock. They have, oh, I forgot, and the response we're looking at is the spawning responses here, the date and temperature of spawning. Similarly, we have laboratory experiments and field surveys for yellow perch. I'm going to go through each of these four kinds of studies, and I'm going to go in kind of an obvious order. I'm going to start with the yellow perch laboratory experiments, and then move back to walleye lab experiments, walleye field surveys, and back to yellow perch field surveys. <coughs> There's some method in that madness, but I can't remember what it is right now. <laughs> All right, so yellow perch lab experiments. And here, this work was done by uh, Troy Farmer, who's a PhD student who just uh, about a month ago, uh, accepted a job as an assistant professor at Clemson University, so we're really happy for him. Um, this work is all funded by the High Division of Wildlife the Sport Fish Restoration Fund. <coughs> and so Troy was measuring in the lab maternal traits and maternal environment, so energetic condition um, of the mother, and then winter duration prior to spawning, so the harshness of the winter prior to spawning. Spawning response you looked at the spawning date and the offspring traits were egg size, egg energy content, hatching success, and larval length. So this is um, the, the design of, of Troy's experiment. He had two factors. One of them was energetic condition entering winter, poor and good. And then he had winter duration, short and long. So a short winter you know, corresponds to something that was over in, in January for like last year. A long winter lasts 100 days, and they're defined by how many days there are less than five degrees. Then he uh, crossed each of these and replicated uh, each three times, eight to nine females in each case, three to five males. And this is this was a really good fun experiment because it lasted for about 15 months, so he had to keep everything going and having no deaths in the lab for 15 months. So in spring 2011, they collected adults from the lake. In summer 2011, they set up feeding treatments at our aquatic ecology lab at OSU. And the feeding treatments were, were um, one, ad libitum rations, so really high rations, or two, just a maintenance ration, so that was a low ration. And when he did this and they fed over the summer, he was able to create two sets of, of fish. One set had lots of excess energy, and the other fish was doing, that set was doing fine, but they didn't have excess energy. They weren't fat. Okay, then in the fall, we started the winter duration treatments. Brought him into the lab where we could control the temperature and started the winter duration treatments. Started by fall cooling, cooling down the temperatures, and then having a winter either 50 or 110 days below 5 degrees, and then gradual warming in the spring. And he fed them a maintenance ration during winter. So this is what the temperature looked like in the experiment. Starting in October through June, um, the short winter is in red, the long winter is in and so it's, they look exactly the same, except for the short winter just was lasted for a short amount of time. These days, 50 days and 110 days, represent the extremes of what we've seen in, in nature. So they actually occurred like this in nature, but they were at the extreme. Okay, so then in spring of the following year, they, the fish spawned or were spawned, fertilized, and we hatched the eggs in the lab. And so this was... So it's really fun when you've done a, this kind of fertilization spawning experiment and you actually get eggs and they actually live. It's really exciting. And these, so these are for eyed embryos. And if you can, I don't know if you can see them, but they're still like in eggs, right? You can still see them. They're in the little round eggs, but if you look closely, well, you can see their eyes, but they're, 
they're just ready to, to, to burst out into larvae, or so soon after that they become larvae. And um, so, this, so far it's been successful, so now let's look at, at the data. So first of all, there is no effect of maternal feeding regime on the energetic condition of, um, um, and energetic condition on offspring states. So it didn't matter if they had been fed ad libitum or fed only a maintenance ration. They, the offspring didn't have different, different traits. We sort of expected that maybe uh, fish that had excess energy might produce more or bigger larvae or eggs. I mean, that didn't happen. Okay, but the other treatment, the winter duration treatment, did have an effect. So here we have the short winter duration, the long winter duration, and the egg mass. So spawners that, that experienced a long winter produce larger eggs than the spawners after the short winter. And we can look at egg diameter, it's the same, the same pattern. All right, so why do we care about larger eggs? So I'm gonna now take this egg mass and show you what it influences. So this is a relationship between passing success and egg mass. So smaller eggs have significantly lower hatching success than larger eggs. So those females who were able to have, be in that long winter and make those larger eggs, their eggs are going to have a higher hatching probability. And then egg mass also is positively correlated with larval length. And why do we care about larval length? Well, larval length is uh, correlated with swimming speed. And the faster a larva can swim, the better it can catch prey, and the better it can avoid predators. Okay, so let me just summarize those results of this set of experiments. Long winters led to larger eggs, larger eggs led to higher hatching success and larger larvae, and there's no effect on maternal energetic condition. I feel really guilty when I, when I summarize Troy's dissertation in, in three lines. <laughs> you know, he spent years doing that and uh, all sorts of people helping that. Okay, so now I want to move on, but we've got to move on here. So I want to move on to the Walleye Laboratory experiment. And in this, okay, you all know where the Great Lakes are in Lake Erie because you're actually sitting on Lake Erie. And this is, of course, where you're sitting. I'm going to take a close-up of that now. This is a bathymetric chart of this area. And uh, the Sandusky River and Maumee River are two big spawning rivers for walleye, and those, so those represent two of the spawning stocks. So we sampled those two rivers for this experiment in 2004 and 2005. So again, we did this fertilization, we collected eggs and milk, and we did fertilization in the lab. So two spikes, two years, and then three spawning times within the year, early, peak, and late season spawning. We only did that in the Maumee River. Sandusky River, we just used peak spawning time. But we wanted to see who was spawning when and um, see if there's any difference in this point. So I'm going to show you data here with spawning period on the x axis, early peak and late, early peak and late for 2004 and 2005. And I'll show you egg survival on the y axis. And this is what it looks like. So, first of all, there's a lot of variation. And that variation is what we're trying to explain with the maternal effects. But even before we get to the maternal trait, let's just look at the, the effect of spawning period. So those females that spawn late in the season uh, had much lower egg survival than the other females. So we can, um, the females spawning late in the season were also spawning at warmer temperatures. So we're not sure the timing thing. We suspected the temperature thing. So spawning late in the season gives uh, lower egg survival. Okay, now let's talk about the maternal traits and how they, reflect, how they um, affect offspring traits. So in 2004, we saw no effect of maternal traits on offspring traits, so we saw no, no kind of maternal effect. Of course, as with most research, 2005 gave us completely different results. So in 2005, the maternal fat index, so this was, the, this was we measured the visceral fat in the females and took it as a portion of their body body mass, the maternal fat index in relative fecundity had positive effect on larval length. So fat females had larger larvae. 
the same things had negative effect on lipid concentrations in the eggs. And we also measured and there are other measures of egg energy content, and those uh, results were consistent. The eggs seem to contain less energy from these uh, bigger females. I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to get to an explanation of why this would occur. We haven't figured that out yet. We have lots of different ways, of, and we're still looking at some data on different kinds of lipids to see if we can get a handle on what's going on. And finally, maternal length had a positive effect on egg survival, so larger female, longer females had eggs that survive better. All right, so just to summarize, eggs spawn late in the season do not survive well. The existence of maternal effects differs by years. So one year we didn't have any maternal effects, the other year we did. And then these are the maternal effects we find in that second year, which I just described, so I won't describe them again. All right, now the field surveys for walleye. <coughs> So in this, we use the Sandusky River spawners, the Maumee River spawners, and the open water reef spawners. So we specifically collected fish at two St. Reefs. And I'm going to show you some data that looks like this. So on the x-axis is water temperature at spawning, and on the y-axis is the spawner length. So each point on there is a week's worth of samples. So it's the mean water temperature during a week when we went out to sample fish, and it's the mean spawner length during that week. Um, I'm going to show you several of these graphs, and what I noticed is that uh, on some of them, the at spawning got dropped off of the axis, but they're all at spawning, so it's just water temperature at spawning. And so what we see in the Sandusky River is this negative interact, I mean, this negative effect. So the, um, at cool water temperatures, we get larger spawners. Now, I could replace water temperature with date, spawning date within the year. So I could say larger spawners <coughs> spawn earlier in the season. They spawn at cooler temperatures. And I could replace spawner length with spawner age. I could show you all those graphing. They look very much like this. So old, larger spawners spawn at cooler temperatures, which are earlier in the season. That's in the Sandusky River. I'm going to add Maumee River there. Similar trend, not as dramatic. To St. Reef, similar trend, more dramatic. So, in general, overall, we're seeing that the, um, the larger, older spawners are spawning earlier in the season at cooler temperatures. Okay, these are males. I said I'm not talking about males. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is, talk, is look at energetic conditions. So we looked at length and age, now does fatness have any importance here? So how do we measure fatness without, without tearing up the fish? And so here's how we measure it. We, uh, this is being the walleye. Here's a walleye that's grown. Here's a walleye that hasn't grown in length, but has put on mass. And here's a walleye that has grown in length, but didn't grow in mass. Okay, so you can see all these fish are different. This fish has a lot of extra energy that it could put into making eggs. These fish are longer, so they have the potential, they have the capacity to hold more eggs. So they have the capacity to build more eggs, but this fish doesn't really have enough energy to do that. So this is why we care about this relative fatness. So, so here's how we measure that. We take a mass by length relationship for all this walleye that we've collected, and we get a, a predictive function through there. And then we start looking at the residuals from this length mass function. And if it's a positive residual, that means the fish is fatter than average. If it's a negative residual, it's not as fat as average. And so now we're going to look at this and see if these residuals from this regression for this function can explain spawning date or spawning temperature. And here's what we see. Water temperature is spawning, this lake mass residual. Um, I'm just going to put in the, the means for each of these spawning stocks. Uh, so one of the things we see is the respawning fish are in, in higher energetic condition than the river spawning fish. But in none of the stocks have any relationship with spawning temperature. So this, this energetic condition is not driving um, spawning time or spawning temperature, but there's differences in, in the fatness and its energetic condition between the, the different stocks. 
Okay, so just to summarize that, we've got big old fish tend to spawn at cooler temperatures earlier than small young fish, and there's no effective energetic condition on spawning temperature. All right, so let's go on to our last piece of data. So I'm gonna, I should have told you ahead of time, I'm gonna summarize all these results at the end because they're getting confusing what species is doing what. All right, so our field surveys for, um, for yellow perch have looked at parental, the parental environment, the maternal environment, that's right, we're just doing mothers here, maternal environment in, in the form of winter duration prior to spawning, or the harshness of the previous winter. And we're looking at the spawning response of date and temperature of spawning. So in this case, we had three years, 2010, 2011, 2012, sampled potential spawners and determined what proportion were spent, that is, which ones had completed spawning. So before I show you more about what our expectations are about what that should look like, I just want to show you something about those three years. So let's see, the blue is 2010. This is on the x-axis is date, on the y-axis is water temperature. The blue is 2010, black is 2011, red is 2012. And what you can see here is that those are three very different years in terms of water temperature. The difference between 2011 and 2012 on any given day is at least three degrees difference. It's more impressive and, and probably more important to say that the, um, in 2012, a specific temperature was reached about 25 days earlier than it was in 2011. So these are really different years in terms of temperature. This is a researcher's dream. So we just had, this just happened to be when Troy was out there sampling. And it was, um, 2012 was a really bad year for fish, but it was great for fish researchers. So, I mean, we were really, this is, we are thrilled with this. Okay, so what did we learn from this? Well, here's what our expectation was. If we have bottom water, te water temperature in, I don't know what's going on there, but I thought we shifted that way. Okay, bottom water temperature on the x-axis. Uh, probability of being spent on the y-axis. We expect something like this, right? So early in the season when water's cool, nobody's spawning yet. Water warms up, they start spawning. At some point at the end of the season, water was really warm. They're all, 100% of them have spawned or have gone someplace else. So there's 100% um, uh, of them have been spent. So what did we see? Let's show the 2010 data first. So this is kind of that mid-temperature year. And so what we see is in the year, um, as the water started warming from you know, six to eight degrees, they started spawning. By the time it was 10 degrees, so this would be 10 degrees, by the time it was 10 degrees, um, about a third of them had spawned. And so on, they sort of spawned over this period as the lake was warming up. All right, so that's kind of what we expect. Now, what do the other two years look like? So the other two years look like this. So 2010, we just looked at, 2011 looked Pretty much like 2010. 2012 doesn't look like 2010. In 2012, we get to 10 degrees, and, and fewer than 10% of the fish had spawned yet. 10 degrees came so fast in 2012, there's no way the yellow perch could be ready to spawn. And so they spawned all of the sudden, and it was losing 10 to 12 degrees, but they essentially were spawning at warmer temperatures than the other, and then in the other years. So, the results here is that following short winters, as in 2012, the yellow perch spawned at warm temperatures. Okay, and I gave you the four pieces of data there. Now I'm going to give you a summary of what, as what I just said, put it all together. So, first of all, we've shown the existence of maternal effects in walleye, yellow perch, and Lake Erie. We're not the only ones who've shown this. Other people have shown it, different kinds of maternal effects. Uh, especially in, in walleye. Let's talk about yellow perch. What are the important things we found in these, these data for yellow perch? So with yellow perch, it was about the maternal environment. So what the maternal, what the mother was experiencing before spawning. Short winters led to spawning at higher temperatures. Short winters led to smaller eggs. Smaller eggs led to low hatch success. Smaller eggs led to small larvae. Okay, so why is this important? Look, well, this is a graph from 1970 or so to 2010 of the annual average ice cover in all the Great Lakes, and it's declining. 
and it's declined. This, this, these data end at 2010, but our expectation is that this decline is going to increase in rate in, in the next 10 years. And so we've just shown that for, for yellow perch, this winter environment, this cold winter environment, this ice cover is really important for recruitment. So what our, we anticipate with yellow perch is that the, uh, the probability, the likelihood of having a good year class is going to decrease as long as we start, as long as we keep having this low probability of cold winters. So early on, we thought warming temperatures may have positive effects on yellow perch in Lake Erie because of the temperature effects on lake productivity and temperature effects on yellow perch growth rates. But that was before we understood these maternal effects. So our results now suggest that maternal effects and the importance of cold winters will result in negative impacts of warming temperatures on the Lake Erie yellow perch recruitment success. Okay, walleye. So with walleye, most of our important results had to do with walleye maternal traits affecting offspring traits. So young, small mothers spawn late at warm temperatures. <coughs> late spawn eggs, we found, were unsuccessful in comparison to, to early spawn eggs. We also found that small mothers tend to have less successful eggs anyway. Okay, and then low energetic condition mothers tend to have small larvae and high egg mortality. <coughs> so what this is telling us is that it's really important in a population of walleye to have old, big fish. In fact, in fisheries, there's this term, BOFF, B-O-F-F-F, -F -F, big, old, fat, female fish. And we recognize how important this is to have in a population. And so we now have two reasons why in Lake Erie this is important for walleye. So first of all, in 2003 we had this great year class. In 2015 we had this great year class. Um, but in those years in between, we didn't have great year classes. And so it had to go for whatever you know, that is, 12 years. Fortunately, walleye can live for a long time but we need them to live for a long time in the system if we're going to have this kind of recruitment drought, this long span between good recruitment events. And so it's really important to have old fish in the population. And then the other reason it's really important to have old fish is because of the effects of the, the, the warm winters. We showed, the graph we showed early on that showed that only in the cold winters with high ice cover do we get this these high recruitment years. So, let me see if I can. Okay. So we put all this together and ask why? Why is this really important? One of the reasons it's important is for making management decisions on the fisheries in Lake Erie for walleye and yellow perch. Right now, we have a really amazingly good way of coming up with. Uh, management decisions, uh, quota, fishing quotas for both walleye and yellow perch. Uh, there are commissions of, that consist of biologists, resource, ma resource managers, modelers, user groups uh, from all the states and both of the countries that border Lake Erie, and they get together and they have transparent discussions on what, how to make these decisions. They don't agree. They're not all as nice discussions. But it's a very transparent process, and it's very science-driven. The problem is that um, going forward, so going forward, we need to incorporate into these models and into this decision-making the idea that things are changing. Right? So we came from a time, we're basing decisions now on a time when we were getting frequent cold winters, and um, when we did these negative, uh, these negative effects of the warm environment were, weren't occurring. And so now what we need to do uh, to be able to sustain these populations, sustain the fisheries, is to make sure that we incorporate the expectation that maternal effects are important, that these cold winters are important, and that we have to recognize that the environment has changed and our expectations for how the maternal effects are going to play out 
in populations based on these cold or warm winters it has to be included in their models as they're making these decisions on how, how to set quotas. So that I'm, that's all I'm going to tell you, and I'll be glad to take questions. on why they're doing this because it doesn't really doesn't necessarily make sense and you wouldn't necessarily expect it. Um, one of the hypotheses is that the uh, uh, larger females are, are I mean, they're large, it means that they've been able to get enough energy early on to spawn uh, compared to the small females. We in looking at sort of progressions of of energy content and, and visible fat indexes over the pre spawning season. It doesn't seem like that's really a good, a good answer. Um, we think that another hypothesis is that some of the really young spawners, that is the first time spawners, they may really not be ready energetically um, until later in the spring. And so that's, so we haven't really ruled that one out. So that may be um, for just like for walleye, that might be for, you know, three and four year old spawners maybe. Um, there, uh, You know, there is a possibility that there's some interaction with the with the older, larger females, but we just don't we don't really have any evidence of that. So we aren't. I have to say that I honestly was surprised at, with those results because I could understand the theory for it in other systems, but it didn't really seem to make sense in walleye. But I think we actually have a lot to learn about about walleye yet, about spawning. It's hard to observe walleye spawning, and so that would be really helpful if we could do that. Yeah. Could there be a learning component? You said there is. Well, we think that that's actually, you know, Roger and I have for years been talking about the idea that one of the benefits of having old females is the the young, you know, the, the young females or and males don't know where to go. I mean, there's they've got to learn where it is to go back to their spawning location, and so it, and it could be, and you know, people kind of scoff at Roger when he says, right, I'm. I think it's really a great hypothesis, and uh, it's just not one we've been able to study. Yeah. In terms of like recruitment, I feel like that that should be known so that we have figured out what that is due to. Well, so that's what we're trying to study: is trying to figure out what is that due to? What what makes it a good year? And so we, one of the things we know is that every time there's a spike, it was a cold winter. But that's not enough. We need more than that. Everything's got to go right, sort of. Yeah. Right. Um, I think. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't think so. There's a lot of walleye out there, and um, right now it doesn't seem as if. I mean, if I if I understand what I'm hearing from the from the models from the the models that go into setting quotas, I don't think that we are expressing the uh, upper end of the walleye distribution right now. Again, I don't know that we really have great evidence of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that, yes and no. So we've looked at kind of, that was one of the hypotheses. Is cold winters, maybe that's, you know, there's something going on that, that's going to be predictive of water temperatures in the spring. And, and so in the data set that we had in 2012, that wasn't the case. But cold winters may have this long-lasting effect through its effect on the phytoplankton and, and then the zooplankton community. And we're studying that right now. So um, Mike McKay we're just talking about is, is actually looking at phytoplankton under the ice. 
And uh, so organisms in, in cold temperatures uh, build a different kind of fatty acids than organisms in warm temperatures. And these are the fatty acids that we like, we want to eat in our salmon and stuff that make us healthy. And so they're good for fish too. So um, we, uh, so right now we have started a study that we're trying to figure out what's going on with the zooplankton. Trying to look at their fatty acids. We're looking at the progression of their communities. We have data from um, Division of Wildlife, you know, sponsored data collection, uh, data set that we call LEPUS, Lake Erie something. And um, we're looking at those data in, historically uh, to see if we can see some relationship in, in the trends over time after different kinds of winters. But what we really want to do is look at the fatty acids in these in these zooplankton, and we've been trying to we've been working on that for the last couple of years. We have um, we're doing lots of things in the lab in the field, and we haven't been successful yet, but we're, we're going to be successful eventually. <laughs> yeah. So with the yellow perch experiments, for instance, when we, we collected fish for those, or I guess the wild experiments too, um, we, when we are choosing the fish to use as spawners in the experiments, what we, we did not want to have fish like in the early peak and late spawning. We didn't want to have fish of all different sizes. Um, so we chose fish to have kind of a constant size across those spawning periods. So we could control for the size effect, um, and then uh, so we did controls like that. So we would choose fish from these different uh, spawning times with the with the yellow perch and with the um, walleyes and different spawning stocks. We try to choose fish in the in the lab experiments that would allow us to give uh, end up with populations that were comparable in the maternal traits, but just had different origins or different timing. So that, I mean, that's really an excellent question. That, those are really hard decisions to make in these, in these experiments is, is how, to, how to allocate these different size classes and age classes in the experiments. And, and even, like with the yellow perch, in fact, there's even some problems with sexing fish until a certain point, you know, and so sometimes you're collecting things you're not exactly sure what you're collecting and we get lucky, we got lucky. But no, we, we, were able to, we kept them for 15 months, but we were able to sex the fish. You mean because they had a, a lot of egg making potential, like there was a lot of fish out there making eggs, is that what you mean? Right, like it's just important to have big old yes. walleye. Right. You're just sort of having those you have three walleye yeah. come of age right now. Right. No, I think that I think that could be important. If 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 you look at um, if you take the number of fish at each age, number of potential spawners at, from each age class and uh, Look at how many eggs you expect them to make based on how big they are. We have a pretty good predictive equation for that. Um, the young classes generally make many, many more eggs than the old classes. But it, but what we're suggesting here is that the old classes may be producing eggs at the appropriate time and at a size that are more successful. So you're absolutely right. That might be. You know, it could be that those 2012 fish are really contributing to that that large year class in 2015. We also, on the other end of the age, there's a point at which there could be senescence in the quality of the eggs. Because the sample sizes, as we get to older and older fish, I mean, we were catching, we caught fish that were 26 years old, but we could never catch enough of those fish to actually include them in an experiment because we were worried about, you know, this question about keeping things standard across the different treatments. And so we don't really know if, there, if, we were, if we're going to see senescence, senescence in walleye. They found that in other animals. We have one more. And then we'll All right. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> 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 
one more question. Uh, it's really cool. <laughs> so the the fish, the fish have scales which you can age somewhat, but usually you can only age them for a few years because they they have rings on the scales that look like tree rings. But the fish have a, a better thing to age, which is the odalith. It's an ear stone, and it puts on rings every day uh, through a daily physiological cycles. Um, by the time it puts on, you know, 40 days or so, we can no longer see the individual days, but we can then start counting years. And so we take this olith out, polish it, and look at it under a microscope, and we can count how old the fish is. You can't do that and put the fish back in the lake. <laughs> Kills the fish, yeah. Skull, yeah. yeah. So we, but in this study, we ended up having to sacrifice a lot of fish, but we got so much data from each fish. We got, I only showed you a little bit, but we know every part of that fish and how much it weighed and how much fat it had and you know, what, the, what the fat density was in it. And so we got a lot of information from that, but we could also take those over us and get the ages of the fish. Great. We can thank you. Thank you. Why don't we uh, just take a little break? We'll start right back up at 8 o'clock. So just about five minutes, and then uh, we'll get going again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was fantastic. Okay. Those questions. Crashing this time. So our next speaker for tonight, uh, our guest lecturer, is uh, Rich Carter. As you can see, executive administrator of fish management research. But as he said for me, he's he's the fish chief. That's the best way to kind of sum it up. So basically, anything the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources, does, whether it's on Lake Erie fish-related things or inland fish-related things, it's your guy. Um, and so, enjoy having Rich here. Rich, you and I have known each other for quite some time now. But it's been, a, it's been a great opportunity for us to be able to talk about what's going on in the academic institutions and how that might help inform agencies. And, and, and Libby's a phenomenal example of how that works for academic institutions to be doing stuff that is knowledge that, that the agencies that are trying to manage our fish populations are doing. So, I've asked uh, Rich to do the same thing, is to kind of talk to you about how he got to where he is. Thank you, Chris. You know, like I said, we've worked together for quite a number of years now, and always appreciate the partnership that we have and, and uh, what uh, Sea Grant does and what Stone Lab does. So, you know, I'm really delighted to be here tonight. A uh, couple, couple of firsts uh, for me. It's the first time I've ever actually spoke at, as a guest lecturer at Stone Lab, and it's actually the first time that my wife has ever seen me speak. So. You know, if you could, at the end, if, you could, if your applause could be just a little louder, that would be great. Uh, you know, uh, I do talk a lot about my wife, and I will tonight in, in my presentation, and you'll see in a, in a minute. So, you know, tonight I will talk about myself in just a second. Um, I'm going to talk really about Ohio fisheries management, what we do, what, where we do it, a little bit more about Lake Erie fisheries, a little specific there, and then job opportunities because I know a lot of you folks are uh, at some point are going to be looking for a job. And uh, I can uh, talk with you about that uh, tonight. So, so about me. So uh, I am an angler. So I, I am a bass angler. That's what I'm passionate about. I was an angler first and realized that you could get a degree in fisheries. And so that's what I did. So, you know, I've done this my entire life. This is just last weekend. This is up here on Lake Erie. There's a lot of green fish in Lake Erie right now, largemouth bass fishing at West Harbor, but that's that's me. I've got a, a bass boat. I like fishing for bass, but uh, that doesn't mean I won't eat a walleye when I catch it because I will, but, uh, you know, very, uh, very avid angler. So, you know, for me, I, I got my, I'm from Portsmouth, Ohio, in Southern Ohio, went to Ohio University, got a bachelor's degree in um, in biology, and at the time, Ohio University was ranked by Playboy as the number one party school in the nation. It was because of my friends. It wasn't me, but, you know, there was – my friends were really good drinkers. I was not. But uh, at any rate, uh, I came here for my final quarter of school to finish out at Stone Lab. And so I took ichthyology, I took fish ecology, her herpetology, and parasitology. And it, it really – this place – changed my life. Um, I, it was here that I met the ichthyologist, Ted Cavender, 
And I ended up writing a grant with Dr. Cavender that got funded, which gave me the funding for my graduate school at Ohio State. So I, I, I ended up getting a master's in fish biology from Ohio State with Dr. Cavender as my advisor. So I, I put Cook Castle and Stone Lab in here. So I was here, really enjoyed my time here. I learned how to study here. I didn't really know how to study until I came here. I went to school six days a week, and it really kicks your butt, <laughs> it, it turns out, you know, and you really got to keep up. And I, I learned how to do that then, and that, that helped me in, in graduate school. You know, I, back then, I stayed at Cook Castle. And, you know, we, we were talking earlier, our fire escape was a rope ladder that you threw out the window. So, you know, that's, that's how it was back then. So masters in, in, in uh, fish biology, as I approached graduation, there weren't a lot of jobs in fisheries available, and I was kind of stuck in Columbus for a variety of reasons, but EPA was hiring. I got a job at EPA, and I actually got a job about a year before I graduated. Wouldn't recommend that, you know, defending your thesis or uh, writing your thesis and then working, but I, that's what I did. Worked at Ohio EPA in really hazardous waste investigation and cleanup for nine years, and then went into private consulting, doing hazardous waste investigation, marketing, managing a part of uh, a couple of the uh, uh, consulting firms that I worked for. And then a after that, it's like, you know, I'd really like to do what I got my degree in. So I sort of networked back in, and I, I didn't join the Division on Wildlife until 2005. And I started as a fisheries biologist in our District 1 or Central Ohio office, and then I've been promoted up the line as a fish management supervisor, and then up to uh, the, the uh, fish chief. So that's my story. Our mission is to conserve and improve fish and wildlife resources for sustainable use and their habitats for sustainable use and appreciation by all. It's all about sustainable use for us. You know, uh, Dr. Marshall talked about sustainable use in, with our walleye populations. We're a division within the Department of Natural Resources. There are several other big divisions like the Division of Forestry, Division of Parks and Recreation, Division of Mineral Resources. We are one of those uh, divisions. But really, when you come right down to it, what we do is we build a better bite. We do that for our anglers. We serve fishermen. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Building a better bite through science-based management, that's very important that we use science to drive what we're doing. Strategic stocking, stocking in locations where we can make a difference. We can stock yellow perch in an upground reservoir in northwest Ohio and influence, start a fish population there, influence that. We can't stock yellow perch in Lake Erie. It would make no sense. Mother Nature stocks it for us, if you will. We develop angler access, and we take care of dams that we own. That's really important, getting our anglers on the water. We get uh, one-eighth of one percent of the gas tax that we use to spend on our launch ramps. And then just working in outreach with our customers, our anglers, so they understand what we're doing and can help us in our endeavors as we move forward into the future. We've got four programs, an inland fisheries program, which is inland fisheries in the Ohio River. That's uh, Dr. Rich Zweifel, who actually manages our, our research programs. We have a specific program for uh, Lake Erie, Travis Hartman. We have research uh, offices in, at Sandusky at Fairport Harbor. Our fish hatchery program, we have six fish hatcheries throughout the state. And then we have uh, another individual, John Navarro, who does our stream conservation and angler access, and probably the most important thing right now is our aquatic invasive species program, because there's a lot of interest in that. I'll talk more about that in a bit. You know, we subscribe in North America to the North American model of wildlife conservation. And I think, you know, basically that model, the tenets of that model, are that fish and wildlife belongs to all North American citizens. In Europe, in many cases, Fishing and hunting is literally the sport of kings. It's very difficult to do. There's a lot of private ownership there. We don't have that. We hold our wildlife in trust for our citizens. So we manage that for sustainable use. There's limited commercialization, democratic law and process, equal hunting opportunities. We believe that it's a privilege to hunt and fish, not a right. Non-frivolous use. These are international resources. Turns out that, that ducks fly to Canada and that fish migrate across international boundaries to Canada. Scientific management, and probably the most important thing is it's user pay 
user benefit. So our funding, basically the Division of Wildlife in particular, we get about 1% of general revenue funds. The rest of our funding comes from license sales, fishing license sales. How many of you have a fish, Ohio fishing license here? Thank you, thank you. You're paying my salary tonight for me to be here. So, and, and then we also get part of a federal excise tax that uh, Dr. Marshall was talking about, the Sport Fish Restoration Fund. That is an excise tax paid by the manufacturer to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that we apply for through, through grants from the service to uh, use for management and study of our fish resources. So I've, I put this uh, fishing rod on here. This is specific to, uh, I, I actually purchased this very rod two weeks ago. And so, you know, one of the things that I, I, that I talk, one, one of the times, and I always tell my wife that I do this, that I sort of throw her under the bus, is that, you know, if you buy fishing tackle, if I buy fishing tackle, it comes back to me. It's like I'm paying my salary. <laughs> and she has never, ever bought that, ever one time. But I always throw it under, and I always get a few chuckles. So that's, that's the idea there. You know, I do, uh, I do spend a lot of money on fishing tackle, and uh, she will tell you that I probably have too many rods and too many lures. But that's, I'm, I'm paying my salary. <laughs> so, so Ohio Sport Fisheries. 1.3 million anglers in Ohio, they fish 16 million days, a 2.9 billion annual economic impact to the state. That is huge. And then 1.9 billion in retail sales, state and local tax revenue, 208 million in federal tax revenue, about 26,400 jobs. So it's a big deal. There's a lot of folks that derive income as a result of fishing within the state of Ohio. Specific to Lake Erie, we have about 400,000 anglers, 800 million in annual economic impact, 480 million in retail sales, 53 million in state and local tax revenue, 54 million in federal tax revenue, about 10,000 jobs. You know, there's about 800, I think, uh, charter captains within uh, within uh, Lake Erie, and it's it's the biggest. Uh, the Western Basin has the largest charter fleet out there, so there's a lot of folks that depend on a healthy Lake Erie for uh, their jobs, and, and it's a tremendous uh, influx of money into our uh, economy. In terms of the Division of Wildlife and how our, our fisheries management program is structured, our administrative offices are at Fountain Square in Columbus. That's where I work. We have an inland fish research unit at Hebron. That's the IFRI right there, and then we have five district offices where we have typically a fisheries biologist and a th supervisor and three fisheries biologist staff and some technicians that, that basically service the geographic area where they're located. They're, going, they're the ones going out and doing the routine sampling and assessment of our reservoirs. And as I mentioned before, we've got a Sandusky and Fairport research station that are on Lake Erie. Lake Erie is our gym, two and a quarter million acres that we own in Ohio out of about six million. It's, it's a big deal for us. Now we manage sport fish. So, you know, our anglers pay our salaries. So we manage the fish that anglers like to catch, people like to catch either for eating, like a walleye or a yellow perch, or simply for catching, like typically a, a smallmouth bass or a largemouth bass, sport fishermen that don't necessarily like to uh, eat fish at the end of the day. How do we assess fish populations? We do a lot of electrofishing, gill nets, angler surveys, stream surveys, a lot of water quality work, hydroacoustics to assess our uh, prey fish densities, trap nets, and then up here on Lake Erie we do a lot of trawling and, and gill netting as well. You know, I don't know if you recognize this slightly younger woman in the pho photograph here, I'm, uh, but, uh, you know, we do a lot of work, a lot of research, as, as Dr. Marshall pointed out, uh, with Ohio State, what uh, Dr. Marshall talked about tonight with, with the walleye and yellow perch research, research that we, fund, we funded. We uh, direct about $1.5 million in uh, research to 
through Ohio State, through the Aquatic Ecology Laboratory. Very good value for us to understand the really the sort of the mechanism mechanistic underpinnings of how fish populations work. It really helps us understand what we should be doing in terms of modeling, like Dr. Marshall talked about, in terms of uh, working with our partners to better understand our fish populations and do manage them more effectively. All that stuff, you know, we're really just curious, uh, want to understand how many there are, what size they are, their growth, their mortality, their forage, the angler impact, all of this, it provides us leverage, and it's leverage really to make regulations. So our tool to manage fish populations in the state is really regulation. So, you know, regulations help us prevent overharvest. We talked about protecting the walleye population earlier in, in the evening in Lake Erie. You know, we feel like the six fish limit that's in place now protects those fish that are in the lake. There's a number of large walleye that are out there now still in the system, and they've been protected as a result of the six fish limit. If we were to go to 10 fish, which we did in the past at one time, that was legislatively driven, we really quickly depleted the fish that were in the lake. So six is a nice number that we feel like protects, keeps a number of the fish in, in the lake for as long as we can make them last, essentially. So we prevent overharvest equitably distribute the harvest. We want to really always increase the sizes of fish caught and the numbers of fish caught because that's what anglers want. They want more and bigger fish. You ask them, that's what they want, and that's what we try to give them. So, you know, regulation development, I'm going to sort of talk you through how we, how we do that. There's a couple pictures of me in here. That's back when I actually was allowed to to go in the field and touch fish. I don't get to do that very often now. I sit at a computer and I talk to people. My job is talking with people and relationship building and, and working with legislators on understanding how fish populations work and kind of that, that stuff. But, you know, we manage for many different sport fish, uh, brown trout in some of our streams, smallmouth bass, crappie, hybrid striped bass. That's probably a state record there actually, but. Uh, you know, one that we caught in our, in our net. And then uh, largemouth bass, uh, which 25% of our anglers fish for largemouth bass. So it's really one of the most popular fish that anglers like to fish for throughout the state. Not necessarily in Lake Erie where it's walleye and yellow perch, but downstate bass are really king. So we develop bass fishery goals, again, maximizing numbers and sizes caught. We serve a diverse interest. There's tournament anglers and fish, people that like to fish on smaller bodies of water for bigger fish. A tournament angler likes to catch five keeper bass that are 12 inches long. That's what we found out. Fair distribution of opportunities are, are important. And again, we want to prevent over harvest. So we uh, held an Ohio Bass Forum. So three years working with the leadership of the bass organizations within the state. 2008 to discuss ideas, 2009 to further kick some ideas down the road in terms of management, and then 2011, after analyzing data, present some ideas for, to better our bass fisheries within the state, uh, and came up with a, a series of uh, recommendations that I'll talk about in a second. What we know within the state, and this graph clearly illustrates it, is that um, and an increase in the length limit will help drive the quality of a bass population. So this is Knox Lake, which is in Knox County. You can see a period where we had no length limit and the size of uh, keeper bass, which in this case would be what we defined as fish that were 12 inches or larger, a tournament size. And, and a 16 inch length, length limit drove the, the size of fish up a little bit, but the 18 inch limit really boosted the population significantly. It's a, it's a tremendous increase. This is one of the best bass lakes in the state as a result of an 18 inch minimum size limit. And you know, what it typically does is if any kind of size limit, you get a buildup of fish that are lower than that maximum length limit or minimum length limit that you have on that lake. And of course, just the uh, 18 inch minimum drove the catch that the anglers were catching 
basically in, increased it, doubled their catch rate, if, if you will. So we tested new ideas with our, our bass anglers. And that, you know, I won't go into detail on these, but basically a 12 inch statewide minimum, a 15, four, 15 inch uh, split daily limit where two may be above and two may be below 15. And then uh, what we call it a super slot, a 14 to 20 inch slot limit, three fish daily split limit where one may be above 20 and two below. This is a, a trophy bass limit or designed to make lakes uh, trophy, trophy bass fishery. We conducted creel surveys where we went out and asked anglers whether or not they approved of certain bass regulations. This is, in this case, uh, the, do they approve of the 12-inch uh, minimum on uh, statewide, 12-inch uh, statewide minimum. And you can see that uh, anglers approved that, bass anglers and general anglers too. Same way with an online survey, just to gauge what our angling public thought about those particular regulations. And in uh, 2013, we proposed the regulations that I talked about. And uh, you know, those are running down the line, it takes a long time to really figure out whether a regulation is effective. We know that the 12 inch minimum is very popular with our uh, tournament bass anglers. The others should work as trophy, especially the, that should help build better bass populations, more and bigger bass uh, throughout the state. But again, the, the jury's out. It really takes about, at least about 10 years to figure out if you're having an effect on uh, any uh, fishery, uh, any type of regulation on any fishery. With respect to Lake Erie fisheries, <clears throat> you know, we, we talked about this. We have excellent walleye fishing. The 2014 and 2015 year classes were were really within the top five. We, we think, you know, nothing can touch the 2003 year class that we have, but we know the 2014 and 2015 is really good. There are a lot of fish that are approaching our 15-inch minimum length limit that are out there. Uh, it's, it's just going to be good. It's a good time to promote that. Uh, it's something that, you know, uh, the success of that fishery, I'll be able to retire on that one. No one will complain about the walleye fishing in, in Lake Erie. So uh, even though my retirement is way down the road, like Mrs. Carter and I have talked about. So uh, anyway. Um, High yellow perch catch rates in, in the west, the, wall, the perch fishing is very good here. We have a reduced yellow perch catch rates in the, in the uh, central basin due to poor hatches. There's a lot of concern over there from our perch anglers. We've had meetings with the perch fishermen as well as uh, state legislature, legislators on the status of the perch population and what can be done and the concern over commercial fisheries. And of course, uh, black bass is really good. Steelhead, we have world-class steelhead fishing on, uh, on the uh, streams to the uh, Cleveland and to the east. And crappie fishing is, is really good here. But Lake Erie is an enormously complex system, as are all the Great Lakes. And you know, we talk about jurisdictions and what happens, and, and uh, Dr. Marshall touched on this a little bit. You know, we, we work. Lake Erie has um, Ontario, and their fisheries are much different than ours. Their fisheries are commercial fisheries. Gill nets are what is primarily used, and they catch walleye and yellow perch there. Whereas in Ohio, our, our uh, anglers, our fishing is for, for walleye, it's strictly sport fishing. But for yellow perch, it's not only sport fishing, but commercial fishing, and we have to balance that we're required by law to allow commercial fishing within the state, and our job is to balance that uh, fishery with our recreational fishery. So, you know, um, the Great Lakes are managed really by the Great, our, the Great Lakes coordination of fish, fisheries interest and coordination of fisheries management is done within the context of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. So these, this, the Fishery Commission works to, with all of these states, to manage for sustainable use the fish populations within the Great Lakes. There's a joint strategic plan for management of the Great Lakes fishery, the fisheries that everyone follows. Any state, uh, Native American uh, province, uh, Canadian province, are all in, are all part of this. Uh, uh, Great Lakes Fishery Commission. 
this is how it's uh, spread out. There's a, a, a light committee that is um, part of, of every lake. In our, in our case, the Lake Erie Committee consists of Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania, New York, and then Ontario. And uh, all of those report through a Council of Lake Committees. But the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, really their job is to facilitate management of the uh, fisheries in, in the Great Lakes, research coordination of all the stuff that's going on within the Great Lakes. And then a big thing in the original mandate for the Great Lakes Fishery Commission was sea lamprey control. And you guys have probably all seen sea lampreys over in the aquatic visitor center. We were looking at some earlier. So a big thing for the Lake Erie Committee in particular is, is quota management. And really quotas identify the proportion of the population that is uh, agreed upon through consensus as a safe uh, level of harvest. And they're assigned by jurisdiction based on the proportion of habitat. This is sort of how the process uh, works. We have both the uh, walleye and yellow perch task group. We take the assessment data, our folks, in our Lake Erie uh, offices are out capturing data right now. You know, this week as we speak, they're out sampling, uh, looking at yellow perch populations, walleye populations, gathering the assessment data. All that information is put into a population model together with our uh, other uh, fishery agencies throughout Lake Erie. They develop a recommended allowable harvest, and as Dr. Uh, Marshall mentioned, you know, there are, the meetings are sometimes contentious, if you will, a lot of different interests, but at the end of the day, everyone agrees to, uh, to this process and it works out and a recommended allowable har harvest has been de developed and discussed through the Lake Erie Committee and a total allowable catch is developed. Each jurisdiction receives the quota based on surface area and habitat, they allocate allocate to the sport or commercial fisheries as they see fit. And the individual agency maintains the management authority over their fisheries. So Ohio has our management authority. We implement rules and regulations to ensure quota compliance. At the end of the day, we allocate 65% of our uh, quota to our sport fishery. This is a policy that we developed, so that's uh, uh, one policy to sort of make sure that most of our quota is given to our sport anglers first. 35% to our trap net fishery. There, there are 12 trap netters that operate in Lake Erie. They operate 18 trap net licenses. And the, so basically this is the, their allocations in uh, millions of, of pounds, if you will. Asian carp in Ohio, it's a big deal. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it's been in the news a lot lately, but there are four species of Asian carp that uh, we're concerned about. Black carp, which we do not have in, anywhere in Ohio. Uh, grass carp, which we do have in Ohio. Those are in Lake Erie. We know that fish are spawning in the Sandusky River. We have a uh, research project that we'll be implementing actually later this month to figure out if we can actually capture and potentially control grass carp. Uh, and uh, more on that, more on just sort of the concept of that in, in a second. But the two big ones are the, the ones down here on the bottom, the big head carp here and the silver carp here. These are uh, filter feeders that have the capacity to filter plankton out of the water. Therefore, they could uh, compete with our young walleye and yellow perch for plankton and perhaps uh, uh, decimate or perhaps impact the uh, populations of walleye and yellow perch in, in uh, Lake Erie and other game fish within the Great Lakes. So ground zero for, um, for aging carp or the prevention of big head and silver carp into uh, the migration of big head and silver carp into uh, the Great Lakes is the Chicago area waterway system. Uh, there is an electrical barrier that is in, in place to keep fish from migrating up, up river. There's a lot 
uh, of, uh, well, let me back up. The entry point for these fish in the uh, middle, uh, in the mid-70s was down here in Arkansas where they escaped from aquaculture uh, operations, got into the Mississippi, Ar the Arkansas River actually initially, and they've been moving up the Mississippi River ever since. Their populations really expanded in, in the uh, upper Mississippi River, uh, and uh, they've been moving up the Chicago area waterway system. There's a lot of fishing that's taking place below this electrical barrier to remove fish, but they are threatening to move up into uh, Lake Michigan. And uh, once that happens, that could be uh, certainly a significant problem. So, you know, the idea with any invasive species is that once, once an invasive species invades a system, it's very hard to get them out. It's, in fact, it's, there's, to my knowledge, there's not been an instance where we've been effective at removing an invasive species once it's in a system. There are potential to, there's potential to control them, just like we do with the sea lampreys in uh, the Great Lakes. $25 million a year is spent on control of sea lamprey populations. Uh, but re complete uh, removal of any species is, is simply not possible, at least given the science where the science is today. So prevention is the key. And right now we, ha we, fo we focus all our efforts really with our partner states on trying to prevent Asian carp from getting up through the Chicago area waterway system. There is a uh, pinch point called the Brandon Road Lock and Dam, and perhaps you've uh, read, about, read about that. Uh, there was a report scheduled for the, um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to release on what the opportunities are to close that particular pinch point. That uh, report was held up by our new administration, and uh, turns out that report will be issued on Monday, and we're certainly very uh, anxious to see what, what that says. But really, the idea here is we need to close the uh, great, close that particular, uh, close that particular lock, or at least put in some um, technology that will prevent Asian carp from moving up that, that particular system. Again, uh, if Big head and silver carp were to get into Lake Erie. The habitat matches their needs. $10 billion Lake Erie tourism industry. As I mentioned, it's an $800 million sport fishery. And if you've seen the videos, uh, silver carp are magnificent jumpers. And I've seen a bunch of them, and they are truly, they really, truly jump out of the water and, and can scare the, uh, scare the heck out of them. So we do know that these fish are in Ohio, they're in the Ohio River. They've been moving up. Again, there's nothing really we can probably do about that. We're going to just see. We are evaluating with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service what they're, uh, what they're doing, tracking their movements. We have a telemetry study just to sort of understand their role in the ecosystem. But they are in the Ohio River and in Ohio's portion of the Ohio River. We in Ohio actually have four connections between the Ohio River and Lake Erie that we are working to close ourselves. And we're using Great Lakes Restoration Initiative money to study the, that and we'll be using that to, to close that. Those systems, this is just one little Kilbuck Creek in, the, uh, in Medina County where um, basically in, in springtime it seasonally floods and there's a connection that's established between the between Lake Erie and the Ohio River. This is going to cost us about $5 million to close, and it's, and it really is it's as simple and as complex as building a dike along this uh, farm field, so, which uh, it is some of the most fertile farmland in, in the state. So our, our, uh, the farmer is uh, cooperative, but we're uh, sort of uh, taking away his, his opportunity. So uh, job opportunities with us. You know, uh, how many of you are in high school now? Bunch of, how many of you are in college? All right. So not, so you high schoolers, you know, just, just, and you, you college folks, there's a lot of opportunities for experience with us. 
We have uh, creel survey opportunities where you're going out and asking anglers how, how to uh, fish. You just you need to have a, a bachelor's degree or be working on a bachelor's degree, excuse me. You should be, uh, have a, be working on a degree in the field. You have to know your fish. The jobs pay really well. You go out on the weekend and ask anglers what they're catching. We also have seasonal opportunities there. We are not really good at this point on internships. You could work with a particular individual or a district office on an internship, but it's not. We don't have an internship program at the Division of Wildlife. It's something that we probably need to get better at, but we don't. We don't have that. Full-time opportunities. Once you have a bachelor's degree, that that we will hire a bachelor's degree level person for. Hatchery technicians working in our hatchery system. Uh, Fish and wildlife technicians, so if you have a degree in wildlife management, you can work as a technician. Um, and the same way if you have a degree in fisheries. These are uh, decent paying jobs for the field, uh, but you know, they're, they're not a, a great paying job. They're just uh, you know, good paying jobs, if you will. And then probably the, the biggest thing uh, is uh, for us is the is a fisheries biologist. That's the sort of the uh, the best position to have, really, if you want to do everything with the uh, as as a fisheries biologist and and the equivalent on the wildlife biologist side too. Usually, at minimum, you need to have a master's degree to work as a fisheries biologist with us. That gives you the you know if we see someone that has a master's degree, then they understand the science behind what we need to do. They've uh, had a lot of experience in, uh, you know, analyzing data. Just sort of under they're well they're a well-rounded well individual, and uh, those are the kind of people that that we look for as fisheries biologists. The other thing that you really need to have is good people skills. I mean, what we do as a division is we work with anglers, and being able to just talk to people is really, really a critical thing. And you know, we there's lots of good scientists out there. We need good scientists that can actually relay that information in a manner that that, a, that an angler that may not have a college degree can understand. Anytime you want to try and get a job with the Division of Wildlife, we have a structured interview process. Just be aware of that. Just don't. The structured interview is a very. You're asked a series of technical questions, is to allow us to get separation on your abilities. So. Uh, be prepared for that. You can, if, if you ever get the opportunity to interview with us, I would recommend that you talk to the individual that's going to be doing the uh, the interviewing, so you understand what their what uh, what their needs are. And you can find all our jobs on the uh, Jobs Ohio website. So um, you know, and then the, the other thing that I recommend, if you're truly interested in working for us, come in and talk to us in advance of any job opening so that we know who you are. It is very important for you to make contact. It, and it doesn't really matter what the job might be. If, it, if you have, are interested in a job anywhere, it's really good to go in and talk to the people that are involved in making the decision so that they see when they see your resume come across their desk, they know that they've talked to you and you know they know what, you, what you're like. And, and they know that you took the initiative to come in and talk to them, and uh, that's that's really important to make that happen. So, uh, just a recommendation there as you, as you move forward. So, you know, I, I guess in summary, I've talked about Ohio's fisheries management, talked a little bit about Lake Erie fisheries, and then I talked about job opportunities. With that, I will. Uh, I've made my last cast for the uh, <laughs> evening, and I'd be happy to entertain any. Uh, questions that, that you might have. I like you. I'm going to stand up and I'm In general, uh, the 
the answer depends on the weather, frankly. I mean, that's, that, that's the thing. So, you know, our, our job, so there's a baseline number of fish that we have out there. And then, you know, so, and we're really harvesting above what we would consider to be a, a safe base level. So, you know, it's 35 for the commercial and 65 for the, for the uh, recreational. So there's a, you know, a set number that, that we're not going to exceed. You know, there, there's a, it's a safe harvest level, if you will. So um, the commercial guys, typically they get, quote, close to their quota because that's what they do. You know, they have nets. They're effective at get, getting those fish out. So they get their quota. Um, but the recreational guys, if the weather's bad, you know, they can't get out. They're not necessarily going to get their, their quota. Um, you know, all, all we can do is set that quota, and if they get their quota, that's great. We know that there's still sufficient sur a, a sufficient surplus of fish there that will protect, you know, the, the fish population, if you will, make sure that it's sustainable. But, but in general, it's weather dependent, and typically, uh, they don't get their their quota. So, that's why I was kind of curious about that mm -hmm. because if that's the answer, then the complaint to have the ability to catch more than six fish per outing on Lake Erie mm -hmm. really doesn't mean anything because most of them aren't getting right. to that anyway. Right, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. You know that, that's a that's a very good question. So you know I, and we the answer to that is somewhat complex when when you come right down to it. So you know we are always trying to get more people to fish, and it starts when somebody's this tall. You know that's recruitment and retention, and that's what we call so teaching kids how to fish, promoting angling opportunities where they can fish, and then. Uh, you know, and then you have the adults, where are their products? Can you buy multiple licenses over a period of time that might keep people fishing? You know, typically people, an individual, if you look at the data, a person will buy a license one year, and then they might not buy another license for another three years. You know, it's, it's just something that they do. But we still have a, a steady number of anglers that, that purchase a, a fishing license, but it's not the same angler buying a license every year. I mean, I buy a license every year. You probably do, do too, uh, Chris, but a lot of folks are just buying every so often. So how do you keep those people engaged? And that's the, that's the challenge for us, and we haven't figured that out yet, frankly. I mean, that's, you know, there are some, some indication that if you offer a multiple-year license, you might get better uh, sales, if you will. But the, uh, the other part of that question is what do we do with the young people that that aren't necessarily getting exposed to fishing. How do you get those people hooked on fishing, if you will, pun intended? And that's that's an even bigger challenge because, you know, our our society has changed. People live in cities now, so it used to be that you know back in the in the heyday when our license sales were really nationally they were off the chart. People lived in the country, and they developed a, a passion for the outdoors. Now people live in cities, and they don't necessarily have that passion, and they're competing for different um, – there's, there's different um, demands for a child's time, you know, playing soccer or, or whatever that, that might be. You know, it's, we, my wife and I had the same challenge with our kids. You know, they're playing baseball and soccer, and it's all this structured activity. Not a lot of outdoor time built in there, and then you got computers and – Stuff that, that are out there. So, how do you how do you hook those kids in? You know, we have been working in partnership, for instance, with the city of Columbus. We have what's called the Focus on Fishing program, where we are providing grant funds for the city to stock ponds in, in areas where there are underserved youth, and they have um, a structured education program. It's part of our Passport to Fishing program, where kids come in and they learn how to fish. And they're there. They have multiple exposures to fishing, and that's the really the important thing with anything. You need to have a multiple exposure to any kind of activity to kind of get it to to uh, 
sink into that, that individual. So a multiple exposure as opposed to a one-time let's go fishing kind of event. A, you know, a kid could go fishing and um, he's not, you know, it'll be just a fun thing to do for a day. But if you really want to build an angler, they've got to be exposed to that activity, angling multiple times. And they really have to have a mentor that can take them fishing. So the Focus on Fishing program provides a mentor in that it's the the instructor who's there every day mentoring the kids on how to fish. And, you know, they, they've, they've run uh, enormous number of kids through that, that program. We think that's the kind of thing that really will have an impact. I know I rambled on your question a little bit, but uh, hopefully I an answered it. Yes, sir. I remember reading a lot about the, the salmon stock approach and the I mean, that's a, that's a very good question, and there are, you know, there are concerns about that. So our, our job is to try and balance that. You know, you, uh, we are always looking at what EPA data, data kind of says if it looks like there's, there's a problem. You know, if, if you talk about steelhead stocking, they're really going to be in the, in the stream for not all year. You know, they're kind of at, at a, sort of a different time, but there could be potential impacts, and that's, that's something that we just kind of – Think about probably something that that requires uh, additional thought as we move forward. But you know, we we do think a bit about that. Yes, sir. Well, you know, so so the question is, how do you uh, mitigate for my, you know migration? How does this impact migratory habits of, of fish? So, you know, for Ohio, and for us in terms of what we're looking at with the electrical barrier over in the Chicago area waterway system, the Chicago area waterway system is is an artificial system that was created around 1900 to drain water away from the city of Chicago. So there aren't really a lot of fish that are migrating through that system. We're not impacting migratory routes of fish through that particular electrical barrier. So, you know, not a concern there. And in Ohio, I'm not, I don't think we have any other electrical barriers that would, would impact fish migration. So that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Um, you were talking that you do surveys about some of the regulations mm -hmm. that you're proposing. Mm -hmm. um, what other ways in which your anglers um, participate in the regulatory, can they suggest things that may be happening in your local river or, or water body? Yes, they can. And in fact, you know, we, we, we hear suggestions all the time <laughs> from our, our anglers. Why, why don't you just do this, or, you know, what do you think about this? And I, 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 I think it's important to really listen to what they're saying because those are observations that they have. They're the folks that are on the water. So we're always listening to what they have to say, to say and whether, you know, and the merits of, of what they suggest. And if it's something that, that uh, makes sense, we're always willing to listen. And that's why we have – the angling summits that we have. A couple years ago, we had an angling summit for Lake Erie, uh, the Western Basin. This next year, we're going to have an angling summit for the Central Basin of, of Lake Erie. Those are our opportunities to sort of interface with our anglers, to understand what their concerns are, and then you know to make management decisions based on what, what we might hear. So we're always willing to listen to what to what they have to say. Mm -hmm. Isn't that Lepmeg, didn't you actually invite some of the anglers into that process? Can you open up the door to the Lepmeg process? Yeah, but the Lake Erie Perch Management Advisory Group, basically uh, that group, there are anglers, 
that sit on that group. There are commercial fishermen, and we may have a, a local um, um, commissioner that will be participating in that that's, that's interested in uh, with respect to the Lake Erie uh, yellow perch over in the Fairport Harbor area, the central basin I was talking about earlier, as well as an angler that's, that's one of the concerned anglers over in that area uh, that can sit in as observers and sort of understand how, how we um, manage the, the perch population. It's a, it's a great, um, really a great way to really include angler input in, in, and into the process. For that one specifically, from what I know, and correct me when I'm wrong, is the complex population models they, they develop, you have to estimate birth rate. Mm -hmm. You have to estimate mortality. Now, is that angler mortality or is that natural mortality, and how does that happen? So to have those stakeholders sit in there and say, all right, tell us how you would estimate how many fish are born in the lake. And they're going to throw ideas at you, and then the DNR can come back and say, we do that, we do that, mm -hmm. we do that. How would you estimate mortality? And they give you some guesses. And then the agency comes back and we say, we do this, we do this, we do that. And so then they understand kind of the ingredients that go into that model, and they understand it better. And the other side that I think that I've learned from talking to some of the stakeholders with that is that as a business owner, so if you're a charter captain, you want stability. You don't want fluctuation. So when the DNR is able to go in there and tell them, we're telling you to harvest here, and it might be lower than the number of the fish that are there, but it's like chasing the market. Like if you want to get up here and then the population drops the next time, you're going to get some fluctuations. And so the DNR, in my opinion, has done a great job over the last decade of really showing people this is how the model is done. And yeah, maybe this year we got more fish out there than, than you want to keep more of them. But if you do that, you're affecting the sustainability of mm -hmm. that resource. And so now those anglers have a better view in because of the work that the DNR is doing on why they're yeah, we work very hard to, to especially, our, you know, our uh, our uh, charter captains and, and that particular industry. We work very hard with them to, to help them understand how we do business, why we do it the way that we do. And we, but we do that with all our anglers because you know it, it just makes sense. So, you know, it, it always uh, um, if, if a bass angler asks, why don't you stock? Bass, then we, we probably haven't done our job in communicating with those individuals because you know bass typically we don't stock bass in Ohio because bass are habitat driven and that, that's what creates a bass fishery is good habitat. It's not stocking would really not provide any kind of real improvement in a bass fishery. But you know unless you're sitting down and talking with our bass anglers about that, which we try very hard to do. You know, they may not necessarily understand that. So, anytime someone asks that question, it's always like, "Well, maybe we haven't done our job in in talking with the, them, even though we we work very hard." It's hard to reach everybody. It turns out, turns out, and it turns yeah, turns out it's hard to reach everybody. Yes, sir. You know, uh, we we always work very hard to educate our anglers about the importance of you know habitat and water quality being one of those one of those uh, metrics. So, and you know, I think uh, Chris, you can you can talk more about what what you do with the uh, with the charter captains. I think it'd be good for you to just sort of talk about that broadly. You know, that that is probably in terms of an educational tool for our anglers is one of the strongest that we have. Uh, Their 
required to answer the question, you know, how bad is the political career? Or, because, you know, are, how bad is the cop in the moment that you don't want to be? So they have that information. And then the, the, the time to get the, the data. The instrument that Justin trains the charge handlers on is really like a six meter long PVC tube. So whenever it's six feet, uh, so when they so when they get on site, when the fishermen start fishing, that charge handler gets up and takes the water sample and comes and asks questions to anglers. So it is a tough scientific charge handler. As far as the nutrient stuff, a lot of that doesn't fall within DNR's purview. A little bit of yeah, it does, but uh, that's our role. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, it's you know, it, it, it's part of the, the holistic message is, is that uh, habitat drives fish populations in general, and water quality, good water quality is necessary uh, for good fish populations. 